Hello everyone and welcome anyone who is listening into today's interview. This program today is made by Parallel Practice Unlimited, a joint venture between Slash Other and ISM magazine, where we investigate the current state of the architectural profession as well as look into what an ideal practice could or should look like. Parallel Practice is part of the Scottish Architecture Fringe core program and it took place physically during the period of the festival. Um, the interview sessions that we are conducting are part of this temporary research practice and will ultimately contribute to a design that, we that will be produced in response to the information we gathered throughout the festival and throughout these interviews. Uh, joining us today is Cathy Lee and Miranda Webster, who will talk to us a bit about their collective Missing in Architecture that was formed to promote creativity and action within the profession. And we'd like to start off with a question for both of you regarding the instigation of Missing in Architecture and what really respired, inspired it at the time it was formed. Do, do you want to go first, Miranda? Do you want me to, you want me to go first, Cathy, or do you want to go? Uh, you go. Okay, well, um, it, as you've said, it was a sort of collaboration and a coming together of uh, educators at the Macintosh School of Architecture. Um, it actually uh, came about on a trip to London uh, between Isabel Deacon, Cathy Lee and myself um, on a train to look at the go and visit some degree shows in London to sort of familiarise ourselves with other work that was being carried out by other schools. And on the journey, um, we sort of felt that we needed to sort of raise awareness and instigate discussion and debate around um, issues to do with equality and identity and um, issues that we felt weren't getting addressed or being addressed in the curriculum and the, the, the things that we teach, the things that are missing, you know, so hence the name Missing in Architecture. Um, and it sort of grew from there. Archie Fringe gave us a fantastic platform that following year, um, or is it the same year? I can't remember, but it allowed us to really focus in on ideas around inclusive design and diversity of idea through a project called Frankentypes. And we looked at um, a project we titled the Institute of the Everyday. Um, and it was really about how do we visualize space and allow other people to participate in the design of their environments um, using a model that was interactive and almost like a sort of plaything. Um, and it was looking and, and a way of actually holding conversations around issues to do with disability, um, diversity, um, the needs of uh, the different needs of, of, of people in society in the, and how we operate in the built environment. Um, and that sort of really sprung, gave us a springboard for then looking at other, other avenues um, within the profession and within education, um, all drawing from our own personal experiences um, and also sort of supporting each other in our endeavours. And I think it's been a really um, fantastic sort of opportunity to have done that as, as, as we would sort of call it in parallel to our practice, you know, so the missing in architecture really is in parallel to our teaching practices as well as our professional practices. So um, it's been a really supportive uh, collaboration. Yeah, and I think one of the main things that we wanted to set up is that, you know, in education, it's very hierarchical and we like to collaborate in a much freer way with our students and stepping out of the curriculum and identifying the things that we didn't discuss. Uh, so those things that were niggling us that we weren't talking about, how do we approach designing as females? How do we feel being females in a very dominant male? I mean, there are issues that we ask. We've reached 50-50 in education, but when you get into practice, that 50-50 split gender drops and women fall away from, from the profession. So we feel as if we are sort of trying to, I suppose, fight for a position. Uh, and I think it was important for us to actually have those discussions outside of the school to find out how our female students felt about their education, um, to get some feedback on a level that wasn't 
hierarchical so we could have even discussions so we had well, i think one of our first events was um our provocations event um in the double it which is one of those lovely glasgow pubs that you know it isn't high architectural aesthetics it was just a lovely comfy place for us to have open discussions with our students and, and that's what started us off mm. and i think we wanted to keep that relationship where we collaborate at a much even level and discuss and treat our students more equally than we would if we'd been in the structure of an architecture school yeah and creating the link between that and your own personal experiences of having gone through architectural education yourself have, have you noticed uh, major disparities between uh, what you observe now uh, in gender differences and diversity in the studio in the academic environment in comparison to when you experience education oh, i studied quite far ago i studied the 1980s and i studied at, at um harriet watt university which is the old edinburgh college of art and uh i we females are in the minority and i only ever had right way through my school i only ever had one female member of staff that taught us and it was i actually felt quite uh awkward speaking to a lot of our male uh staff uh, tutors and it didn't feel as if it was collegiate um and there were no influences in the curriculum either i never saw any females um put forward as uh architects to follow so that was what how many years ago is that too many decades ago when i went into practice i felt that um i was often treated lesser than my male colleagues but it wasn't until i came back to scotland after working for a, a female um, housing association so united women's homes association where the women were mainly in charge and it opened up my mind i'd never been taught or raised in my architectural education before that that, that this was an issue and i hadn't i was sort of blinded to it and then um, having worked in the women's housing association and coming back to work in scotland i worked for gareth hoskins um, architects and he had a completely different attitude to practice to all the other practices that I'd worked in. And he was very into family, not working way, um, supporting members of staff who beca became pregnant. So the women who became pregnant were embraced back into the practice once they returned. And, you know, that I think that was a turning point for me. I don't know about you, Miranda, how you felt. Yeah, I mean, I think um, so in, in the school being taught by predominantly men and the cohort I was in was very much do, um, mostly mostly uh, male as well. It, it did sort of impact on your confidence a little bit in, in actually would people listen to you and I think that's all part of this trying to formulate your architectural identity in those days I think didn't really come for me until I was in practice until I had gone through part one experience and then my part two experience and I think I was really fortunate for the people I worked with in my part one I worked for a woman called MJ Long who um, was uh, the co-designer of the British Library with her husband and she actually then set up her own practice and it was really run by women and it really did open my eyes uh, as Cathy was saying about you know how how strong women or women with opinion can actually make a huge difference um and that I think really did set me up from coming coming back to do my part two um it gave me a little bit more confidence um and then I I suppose going back into work as as a part two uh, student I found that I was able to sort of direct my myself and target particular practices a little bit more assuredly um, and ended up working for Deborah Saunt uh, who set up her own practice at the time was very very small um, and then since then she sort of snowballed and become much bigger and they're interested in the sort of built uh, sort of urban space and activating public space through housing and um, and buildings with a social agenda quite often um, I latterly then went on to work for uh, Allies of Morrison, who you may well know are quite a large company, um, but their 
structure, their, their sort of management and sort of hierarchical structure was very, very evenly mixed gender wise. And they also um, had Bob and Graham, the two partners at the top of the tree, basically brought down and they were sitting amongst us all and they would have regular design sessions with all of the teams that were working. So there was an accessibility to the conversations that were being had. So you got a sort of insight into the, the architectural references that they made um, about and through their work. And you could see that sort of, you could see that sort of um, development of an idea through to realization. So that was really quite significant. And then after that long story, I suppose, but I, I had my kids and thought, you know, actually, am I gonna sort of manage to balance practice and working for somebody else um, alongside bringing up my kids or, uh, at that point, then my husband and I, who's, our, who's also an architect, decided to set up our own practice. And it was really actually um, a bit of a sort of uh, experiment to begin with. We moved from London back to Scotland. Um, and it was really, I suppose, because of the inflexibility of working in practice and having kids and actually not being able to necessarily work full time all of the time and actually being a partner in your own practice gives you that privilege of actually saying I'm sorry kids are not well can't do this however tying it in with the teaching has really really given me a confidence um, in what I do and what how I think about things alongside the practice which I've now sort of taken both feet out of. I'm fully, fully immersed in my uh, in teaching. However, it's still going on in the background, and I, you know, obviously still involved to a certain extent with the practice. Um, but it, I think, applying a lot of my own experiences um, in practice to the people that we employ. So we're now um, a practice of not including myself, three three women and two men, and it's like hurrah you know um and we've got to negotiate as employers we've got to ne negotiate uh staff that are you know on maternity leave um both male and female you know sort of paternity and maternity leave there's issues that arise when the kids are sick and all of this sort of stuff so as a business it's you've got to be sort of flexible and agile and um and accommodating to, to all of these things, which is which is right and um, important to to us. Uh, so that's that's my experiences in a nutshell, really. Long nutshell, big nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of bravery to step away from the safety of a job, let's say, and to make a decision to set up your own practice, and it's really exciting. Um, really exciting concept for a lot of young students in architecture and for our age, etc. But um, there's also a high amount of risk involved in it. And the fact that you have to do that uh, to receive your own autonomy and receive your own flexibility is kind of conflicting, you know, yeah. and you're in a lucky position that you're able to do that. But also, I can imagine bringing your practice home and setting that up with your partner, having the flexibility did you, were you able to manage a work-life balance? Yeah, I mean, it, I sort of, I suppose, as the mother and primary care provider, I, I felt it was, you know, I was the one who sort of took a slight step back and did the flexible, you know, going to the doctors with the kids or dropping them off at nursery and, and Stuart, my partner, which is probably a bit gender stereotypical, did the practice running. Um, I think, um nowadays i think that and this goes back to sort of the education and the journey that students take from first year through to fifth year i think that they find their feet and they find their identity and who they are and what they're interested in much earlier than i did and i think it then allows students now to really have that confidence and passion and drive to actually you know go out and set themselves up there is unfortunately a, a financial implication with that though you know you need to be able to earn money to pay the rent and to eat and and all of that and it might be working for a pra practice with that insight 
earlier on, you know. So I we sort of were 10 years working for other people before we were able to set up our own practice. And it became because of our situation. It wasn't necessarily the ultimate ambition, whereas I think students now have that ultimate ambition to do that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and one, of the things that, yeah one of the things that Miranda and I were discussing this afternoon, because this is the parallel practice, is that as educators, we're not really part of conventional practice. So we're sort of paralleling things that are in our of our interest within architecture, but it doesn't end up with a, a building at, at the final outcome. But one of the things that we, from our own experiences and the things that we want to instill in education, and, and when we were educated, it was that macho, you've got to work long hours, you've got to do all nighters. And that is something that's embedded. I, I still sort of think that I can move into the evenings i'm not I, I don't have children so i do have that freedom but that's that's a wrong way to educate ways of working because it doesn't give you a, a work-life balance and we shouldn't be asking our students to to work long hours and absolutely you know exhaust themselves and and it's got to be an enjoyable thing and so the thing that that miranda and i were talking about is we want to engender in the in, in the architecture schools is a way of working that allows you not to work into the uh, into the evening and they'll do all night it's because that's not something you want to carry into practice it might be exciting to do and every now and again but that shouldn't be a sustained thing and we need to i suppose nurture that way of working in a short sharp burst in a much more professional way so that our students come out with a different mindset and try and change that long hours culture that still exists in a lot of practices and, and it shouldn't be handed down because it tends to be the associates and, and the directors who hand that down to the younger staff who, who join yeah. and they're expected to set do by example. Yeah. 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 And set by example. Yeah. I think the more that we arm our students with ways of learning for themselves, put the control into, into their hands for how they learn the better and the more confident they are when they do step into practice. So if you're disciplined and organized and have a structured way of organizing yourself and your work and your thought process, um, then you'll build confidence and you'll work efficiently and effectively. And so you can do a nine to five day and then park it and then be refreshed for the next day. And it's trying to instill that sort of process of, you know, doing a work ethic. You know, that's, I suppose you could call it a work ethic. And I think it then builds into the way that you design and think about other people and you think about our society and you think about the way that our climate is changing and the impacts on that. So it, it actually goes full circle, um, and, but it stems from how you operate as an individual. And I think for me, that's sort of trying to um, arm or what's the word, empower students to be able to have the confidence to do that. And with the RIBA mandatories coming up, it's that ethical practice and what do we mean by ethical practice? And I think part of ethical practice is treating your staff that you're not asking them to work long hours, that you are engendering a fairness in, in the way that you organise your staff. And it doesn't, it doesn't sort of like, I suppose, um, disadvantage women um, by being mothers. And, and, and on the other hand, that pe uh, fathers should also be treated to have time off work and allow to enjoy their children. And <laughs> one of the things I've learned is, is that the, some of the most efficient workers that I've come across are women because they know that they have to stop, go and pick up the children and have to, to complete their tasks and they're very focused. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I think in, in architecture school, we push students to strive for perfection, whatever that is. And that that's never achievable. And it's known when to stop and when to move on and make the next decision. And I think that's something we really want to nurture within our teaching. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, thank you uh, for highlighting this. Um, the issue of like ethics within the profession, I suppose, both as a student, as as a professional, uh, getting into the workplace. And I think a lot of people find that 
maybe you set yourself five years okay i can do this for five years but then realizing oh no this isn't five years this continues into practice and this yeah. kind of exploitation almost of, of a young workforce working overtime unpaid um but we're seeing a lot of discussion about this uh, and the RIBA is talking about the compact, uh, this kind of ethical framework that's going to be introduced. Um, how, how do you have any kind of like way of um, integrating that more so into pedagogy as well so that it's um, in collaboration with the RIBA about um, having fair workload and uh, getting people prepared to get into practice as well in that sense or um... I think it's having the opportunity to discuss these issues with students because sometimes you don't get that chance um, you know if you're in in the, in the Mac you're talking either in, about studio stuff or you're talking about uh, technology or you're talking about professional practice in and, and that's very uh, focus on contracts and, and the, the everyday running, but it doesn't talk about the effect it has or how you conduct yourself. And I think, you know, obviously we do have a professional um, conduct uh, regulations, but that doesn't talk really about how you treat people. And I think that's one of the things that we like to discuss is you have to be able to have these open discussions. I mean, it's up to a student where they want to work, but have those discussions about, do you really want to work for nothing for a well-known practice? It's good for your CV, but you've had five years of training. That's, you got a lot of knowledge and you shouldn't undervalue what you are and what you've learned and, and what skills you have. And in a way it's exploitation. So if you don't have those discussions with students before that they go into practice, we can't assist them to be confident in saying, no, I'm not working this, these long hours or, okay, I'll do it this time around, but I'm not going to do it. You know, so it's, it's, have that, it's to instill students with a confidence to, to make their own decisions about how they want to work and not to be, I wouldn't say exploited, I don't think practices intend to exploit them. I think practices are in a difficult position because our us professional standing is not what it used to be and fees are, are really difficult to get a decent you know amount of money in order to pay your staff well but at some point the profession and institutions education issues have to make a stand and I think that's something that we're quite keen on supporting that you know we have to it's a non-unionized profession so if I uh, my partner is what's the NHS the highly unionized and they wouldn't stand for a lot of things that our profession stand for. And I think that we sometimes have to look at ourselves and say, let's do things in a better way, in a fair and better way and treat people, either your employees or your clients or whoever in a much more um, fair way. I mean, equality is something that missing in architecture are very, uh, I suppose it's one of our main themes is to, to make sure that we are treating people equally um, or with equity. Um, I don't think we should treat people any equally, but there, there is a way of pushing people who are disadvantaged or not being treated well and highlighting the fact that we need to address these issues. And would you, do you think there's a conflict there? because a lot of the profession is about expressing your individuality and then uni unionizing yourself as a workforce that's a contrast to that perhaps do you think that that is well, part of the issue or yeah i would sort of disagree that it's about individuality i think architecture whatever you do is a collaborative profession you can't do it without anybody else you can't do it without engineers you can't do it without suppliers you can't do it without contractors whatever you do it's never going to be necessarily a lone vision or hardly ever a lone vision um, and I, I think in architecture school we tend to make students individualists instead of collaborators you know the whole system about marking and assessment focuses on the individual but you get I think you get a lot more out of collaboration and it's a much better way of working and I think yeah schools have to move more in that direction. I think that's been evident, hasn't it, this year when we've all been online and students haven't had access to their studio and those incidental comments and com conversations that happen in the studio haven't been there. 
and the, the sort of feeling of the, the sort of group work has been more difficult. I think more, it's been much more difficult to sort of um, support that this year. So fingers crossed for next year. But um, I, I would agree with Cathy, you know, you can't, as an architect, you're never a lone person doing it. You're never sort of the individual. You've got to obviously work with your with your client and your and the users of the, of the of the building that you're producing as well as the contractor the contractor can come up with some fantastic solutions if you if you communicate with them and it is does boil down to communication but it has to be um a collaborative otherwise it just um it it, it doesn't really work and it, there is a sort of misalignment there i suppose with the way that you're taught as an individual to have your opinion and your you know idea um but i hope that we are with with the tools for then that that exploration and, and to ask those right questions for when you go out into the real world this is actually my identity but i want to you know focus on a wider um theme or a wider aspect of architecture or um a particular place a particular typology whatever um so yeah really that's what's really impressive about the work that you do like you mentioned a few times the keyword collaboration and that's something that we just don't get in the educational environment but also as a fault of our own like um a, the competitive nature is also i would say naturally bred and then you come out from that educational system and that perspective remains you actually have to learn collaboration I think it's something I don't know. Secondary education doesn't promote that either. There's no not a lot of group work in secondary education. They come into Kathy. Maybe you can um, continue this, but you know they're actually all individuals. They come into School of Architecture, and actually we need to talk to teach them a little bit more about peer collaboration and learning from each other and valuing the voice of that somebody else in their cohort, you know, and it, but it's true, you do set, you are set up as a sort of slightly competitive group that again, you're competing against your peers, whereas it shouldn't be, it should be a collaboration more. I mean, it's interesting because we, we set up the um, first experience at the MAC and we've got two courses, which are called CoLab 1 and CoLab 2. So CoLab 1 is we, ask our students to collaborate over a, a, a theme, over a project brief, this year it was being human, and then um, they share that with all the other disciplines in the art school. And that's quite interesting because they can see how other people work in their own discipline. And then the second part is called CoLab 2, where they are into disciplinary groups, which is really good in, in first year because you're learning how other people think, other, have, other, other creative disciplines have other ways of doing stuff. And you're not just in this, I'm the lone architect, I'm, full of, uh, uh, I'm in charge of all the aesthetics and all the ideas. What you're seeing is, is an array of different ways of creating um, pieces of work. And I think there's always that thing, oh God, not another piece of group work. When actually it's not really what we call group work, it's collaboration. Collaboration can mean a lot of different things. It can mean listening to other people or it can mean working on a singular output and and i think it's understanding that that there's different ways of working which isn't just the the lonely student plan on in the middle of the night struggling with i don't know what i'm doing or you know i need to ask somebody and i, it, it, I think a shared is a shared architecture is a shared experience it's much more enjoyable that way and it can get fractious but it is it's a shared experience and there's ups and downs and and all those things but to know that there's a group pulling in the same direction is a lovely thing and to get a building at the end of it is a lovely thing so um yeah group work is not the the dreaded thing that lots of students think about it's actually something you you learn life skills and so we i think we need more of that in school and, and most of our institutions aren't set up for that for the easy easy um you know, working together it's a whole assessment and, and it's funny, we had that competition, we had a um, discussion, another Archie Fringe event that we did, which is modes of travel and investigating and doing provocations, but what, what's the expectations of first year? 
um, which is the often forgotten uh, year in, in any school. And um, a lot of them saying that they felt it was too competitive and they were working against each other and they realised it didn't have to be that way. And because we're grades oriented and we have to publish and grade students, that makes it even worse. So it's ra rather than looking at, are we doing a good thing? Um, you know, everybody seems to be focused on have I got a grade A or I'm a failure to get a grade C and you know, that's not what life's about. So I think in, in terms of what we're trying to do, we're trying to sort of change an emphasis on on the way that schools have been for a long time and, and make it a softer thing, um, much more hard edged. And I think the things we're facing in terms of climate change and um, global injustice and, and exploitation, I think we just have to be much more careful about the decisions we're making in, in architectural practice. And that's all coming forward in, in so many fronts. There's so many different bodies around ACAN and um, uh, Architects Declare and RIBA obviously moving on it and ARB and, R and RIAS are working on it. So the schools are part of that forefront as well. Uh, we're at a really interesting change in the profession, moment of a change in, in the profession. It's exciting to be in, in education, exciting, it should be exciting to be in practice. Yeah, definitely collaboration is the key word within architecture. That's often forgotten as you said but I think it's so interesting that you all sort of came together as a collective because again that's a sort of like self-motivated um, thing and a decision to sort of you know decide to kind of make a change and um, I just wanted to ask about how you feel that the collaboration within sort of working within MSA um, like the McIntosh School of Architecture because like me as a student there you guys are quite a visible organization and it's always really nice to see that there's always things happening and it, it feels like things have been changing. Um, and also how does that sort of compare to perhaps when you are collaborating with GSA and the sort of wider education board, and then as well as maybe kind of getting in contact with similar organizations in architecture schools in like Scotland and the rest of the UK? Well, I mean, that was always our ambition. Um, to actually make it a much wider um, collaboration with the schools of architecture. And kathy has been doing sort of the, the networking with the stage one, the year, your know, first year um, network with Dundee, um, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, and Strathclyde and, and Glasgow uh, School of Art. Um, and But originally Missing an Architecture has got an aim and ambition to actually spread ourselves around a little bit more and to sort of put out these um this network so that is that is the ambition in terms of like i suppose the, the sort of gsa and the wider sort of institution um i suppose it's it's a tricky one because whilst whilst we sort of feel like we're in a little bit of a bubble that's associated with msa there aren't that many opportunities to really sort of go into another department, possibly, or you know maybe we should be pushing that a little bit more to sort of hook up with um, fine art or product design or or some you know other textiles, for example, and actually you know shake things up a little bit um, with them. I think it's quite interesting working in an art school because I think what you find is um, the architects are the problem solvers, and then you might have fine artists who are more, I suppose, curious and thinkers. And so th there's a longer um, and wider, I suppose, history of feminism in art. And then in architecture, that it was never discussed, never discussed throughout. And I'm sure all three of you would say you've never spoken about feminism in architecture or equality of space and spatial justice how do females feel, how, do, how, how does a homosexual feel in, in, uh, in their environment, how does um, a vain person feel in their environment. We've never spoken about that sort of thing and looking at the people who have always been pushed to the periphery, whereas I think the art artistic community, the art community tend to question and, and provoke, but we don't as a profession because we're too busy getting on with the building. And I think all those things have an impact 
how we design our environments have an impact on, on people. And I just think um, that we need to just change the emphasis a bit. And, and, and the other thing is, I think I was going to say, again, that there's a bigger movement down in London. There's obviously a bigger uh, mass of practices and schools. So you've got part W who are shaking the, the tree a bit. And then in Australia, you've got Parla. Um, but there doesn't seem to be that many other organisations similar to us up here. And we're, we're more than happy to embrace anybody else who wants to join join in the discussions and, and look at the changes. Yeah, and it goes it goes back to that sort of um, idea of research as well. The fine art, you know, the fine artists, uh, the fine art department, other departments within um, the School of Art have a very much more focused research element and then there's a there's a couple of um women who are writing about you know the lost women of art and scottish art and and you think actually you know we we should be doing that for for architecture um and i and i suppose we're sort of behind the curve with that and that was another reason for setting up missing in architecture was actually to sort of try and drive through a little bit of research and actually bring it to the foreground, bring it to the front and say, well, you, look, you know, you've got all of these women that are never promoted who have done, you know, X, Y, and Z um, and are sort of slightly forgotten about because it's always the men, the male, white man uh, architect who sort of championed. And, and yet I think the sort of fine artists have sort of got ahead of the curve slightly with that. and. Uh, I think that's definitely an ambition that we have a missing in architecture that we are in the foreground a lot of issues to do with equality diversity and the and the questions that are being raised about you know contemporary design in a changing environment um and i think yeah that we just haven't got enough time to do it all in <laughs> but we, that's why missing in architecture was uh, established <laughs> so that we could spread it all out and get people, deploy people all over Scotland and beyond. And on that note, uh, what is your next next test plan with with MA? Oh, it's been um, such a heavy year in education with um, the pandemic that we haven't really had time to even think about what our next things would be. I think we're going to wrap up the stuff um, for modes of travel for Archie Fringe. And then I think uh, we're going to have to regroup. We keep saying we're going to have time away to, to... Yeah, what we'd really like is to go on a little retreat um, up to Cove Park or somewhere and actually just lay it all down and just say, look what we're doing. We've been running a, a successful lecture series that Alicia was helping with last year. And um, that actually has changed mindsets in the school. You know, when we when Missing an Architecture started the lecture series, 2018 was it Kathy? Yeah, yeah. It, it was the first time we we looked at the lecture series list, and it was predominantly men that were invited to speak, and we changed that on it. We turned it on its head, and we also changed the fact that it actually wasn't just architecture that people were coming to talk about. They were coming to talk about their practice in um, research in in um, yeah, just was talking about disability. disability yeah a whole range of different people that came yeah, to yeah. spark debate and right. um, we had she was great she talked about um gender issues and inequality in the pra in the profession and in education so all, yeah. all these things you know so normally it would be you know a very famous architect to come in and everybody be there loving and and, and I, I agree i enjoy those um i enjoy those lectures you know, but sometimes we don't just don't talk about the peripheral things that are actually the things that have impact on other people. You know, if we I don't mean, in light in light of all of our sort of the, the last couple of lecture series and the network that sprung up from that, it allowed us to um, do a, a, a present or what's the word organize a symposium called the Equal Architect, and that was in January two thousand and nineteen. And um, we had a keynote speaker, Sarah Wigglesworth, who was fantastic, really, really uh, significant, um, mm. both in her teaching and in her architecture and in her um, 
sort of groundbreaking ideas about environment and uh, materiality and construction of her own house, experimental house, the straw bale house. Um, and she really captured everyone's imagination and enthusiasm. And the Equal Architect Symposium really sort of set us this challenge of asking these questions, which we still need to go back to and evaluate and pull out some, comb through it all and pull out some actions from that. And that's, you know, 2019, and we still need to do that. We were set obviously with um, the pandemic, it sort of slowed everything down. So we do have action plans moving forward, lecture series, which I think is, is so fundamental now to the way that, that we are operating, but also just sort of building on the idea of the equal architect and actually, um, all of the issues that we want to promote in our education and going into the profession for our students. Yeah, and I think it's slightly disappointing on, on those occasions when we realise that we're always there to support the sort of general things that are happening in architecture and lectures. But when it becomes something that is perceived to be a female based subject that our, a lot of our male colleagues aren't interested and I think that's one of our challenges is to say well we've always gone along to men speaking we've never questioned it and then when we put it on a series of lectures that are predominantly female speaking or more peripheral then there's less interest and, and I think we've got a sort of challenge to change that mindset somehow. Yeah so we're always working we're always thinking about how we can raise awareness and change the status quo. So change the reading lists, you know, freshen up the way that we review um, all, of, all of these things that change behaviours ultimately, so that going into practice for students is, is um, on a level playing field and a more equal footing um, and with confidence, hopefully. Yeah. So who knows what the future will bring, but we need to, we need to, uh, I suppose, um, uh, recover from the pandemic and then look forward to a much brighter future and one more tackling really important issues. And I think one of the most one, important ones is our climate and to, you know, trying to be fairer to people and planet because that's something that is, you know, facing our profession is the most urgent thing. So we are, yeah. We're looking forward to the, these uh, these things that we have to tackle with our students. And uh, maybe um, jumping on to the the um, the pandemic and the kind of collective in many ways, but individual in many ways as well. I suppose uh, experience that we've had through the pandemic. Um, what would you say have been lessons kind of learned? I suppose from the pandemic for you, uh, both within. Uh, education as well as within M MIA um, would you say that you because it's obviously opened up for discussions in a very different way so there's been positives coming out of it as well uh, along with the negatives um, it would be interesting to hear your reflections on that reflections on the pandemic in education um, I, I think the world has become a smaller place it's easier to hear what everybody else is saying it's easier to contact people and, and speak to them but the loss of face-to-face -face you know, actions and, and, and in, in, interactions with people, I so miss, so miss, and, and I'm sure Miranda will say, so miss seeing our students and our first years were fantastic. But for them, I just think, where's that experience of meeting lots of new people, studying a new subject and, and collaborating and collectively enjoying that together? It must have been so tough for them and, and so yeah. we're so looking forward to maybe having those restrictions lifted if we could go back to face to face if it's safe enough i would <laughs> look forward to that yeah i, I also think know. um the physical environment um away from a screen yeah. actually you know it's been fantastic as kathy said you can connect with people you can see all of the stuff that's published online much more accessible meetings and all of that sort of stuff but actually, from a student's point of view, it could be overwhelming because there's too much information. How do you, you know, comb through that and find out what's what's important? What do you really need to look at? What's really valuable? And I think for me as well, I suppose when I'm thinking 
about next year and planning and, and research and things, you can go, you can get distracted very easily by, you know, um, links to websites to um, things that you maybe want to see, but you just don't have the time to watch. So it is, I think, a time away from the screen um, will be so much beneficial for everyone, mental health wise, and also work wise, I think you've become more focused and um, uh, objective when you're away from the screen. Social interactions and having those informal chats about architecture. I've really missed that because in Zoom, it's more formalized. It's very difficult to have two or three conversations going together. And I just look forward to sitting in a social space with somebody, I'm gonna say pub, um, but you know, having I, those lovely chats. I was mortified the other day. Um, I was out with Robert and Isabel for um, lunch. It was a few weeks ago and uh, walking through Kelvin Grove Park and uh, a student came up to talk to us and I had no idea who she was until Isabel said, that's one of your stage five students. And it was Alessia and I couldn't believe I didn't recognize her. And it's because you just don't see, you know, she's not in my tutor group. So I don't see her week, every day. And some students don't switch on their cameras. And it was just like, oh my goodness, if that if we'd been in a normal environment, you know, in the studio, we would have, I would have known her. Um, yeah, it just made me like, feel really like sort of disconnected. It's all those things where you're going around the studio and you're saying, hi, how you doing? How's the work going? And everyone's going, oh, it's great. Or they're going, oh, we've got a deadline coming. And, and, and those reassurances and, and just listening to, to students talking you know, about how they're getting on and oh, I just miss that so much. And it, it must have been a really, tough year for a lot of students and um but i think the work i think from what we've seen the work hasn't suffered i think there's a lot of um been a lot of strain on students mental health which i think is an issue uh and that's been increasing never mind the pandemic i think you know all these stresses with finance loans and and, and paying for your education all of that is has been stressful and then to have the pandemic on top of that it's it's not the most ideal thing but yet the work still is good quality despite all that they always surprise us well they don't they always do really well <laughs> always always beyond their expectations but the resilience that everybody has which is very impressive um, but the peripheral learning, I completely agree. It's something we even miss working now. I miss being in an office and hearing calls going on where you would learn so much from someone else's conversation with an engineer. With, and it is just a profession where um, you need to physically be there. But also, hopefully, one positive might be that it alleviates a certain strain that we don't need to be committed to a nine o'clock to seven o'clock office physical. Um, so it's bought a lot of positives yeah. and well, that's a really lovely point you made there but because it's it's that thing about if you're in an office and you're hearing more experienced people and you're learning how people are dealing with others on the phone or you know conversations going on you pick that up you can't do that when you're just stuck in a computer and it's the same in education you're watching other people do things you're learning from upper school students and lower school students are you know are having conversations and it's a supportive environment or it should be a supportive environment and I think that's so important and that's I think one of the key things that I think we missed this year. Talking about missing in architects, that's what we really did. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully we do step away from the digital dependency um, to an extent of learning things. Uh, I think a key part of your description of yourselves is taking action within the profession and uh, within education. So we've uh, gone through so much this past year. We read articles, we've had discussions, uh, I mean, amongst ISM and slash other and amongst ourselves, you take everything online, but now it's about taking that into action once the pandemic lifts. And I think that's really gonna be the true test. Um, so you guys um, speaking about your action plans, we're really excited to see them take place and hopefully we can stay in touch. We'll keep an eye out definitely because you've definitely been an inspiration for us when we were students. The lecture series um, was so inspirational. I'll never forget that Sarah Wiggles. Oh, were you there? Oh, oh, it. Fabulous, isn't it? Yeah, she is. A, she is the ethical architect, and she's been it for decades. Yeah. 
we'll let you get back uh, to your Thursday evening. Thank anyway. you so much for inviting us. I'm really honoured to be a uh, chance to talk and we look forward to seeing what your um, overall uh, impressions and uh, I suppose analysis of, of all the speakers. So that would be good. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet us today. It's been very interesting. Thank yeah. you for having us. Yeah, thank you.